The Willamette Valley in Oregon is the grass seed capital of the world. In today's video, we'll look at how grass seed is harvested, processed, and ultimately shipped to you as the end user. We'll get an inside view of the seed facility as well as ride in a few machines as harvest was just getting underway during my visit this summer. Our first stop was at Golden Valley Farms. Some of these clips will definitely be noisy as this is a working facility. We'll get to the actual harvest later, but let's look at how seed is brought into this cleaning facility. This is kind of where the things get initiated, all the shipping documents, the sales made, and Josh gets his marching orders as far as what's going in the blend, what lots are getting in, and he makes it happen. But I think where we should probably start is, okay, we, we're right now getting close to harvest. It's going on as we speak, but seed's now gonna start getting brought in. We have raw seed from the field which has been run through a combine, so a lot of the material is gone. We're hoping that they don't bring in the entire field. Combines go out, we get seed brought into the combine, it then gets loaded into these doubles out here, which then gets brought to Josh, which is a seed cleaner, and then Josh gets to going on clean, and then we're doing quick turnarounds from there. The amount of clean out affects the speed at which we can run the cleaner. I mean, right now we're anywhere between 2,000 pounds an hour on really high trash to four to 5,000 pounds an hour. So it really has an effect on it. When you have a traveling cleaner, you know, as a combine out there, and Dwayne, I mean, Dwayne's spending all day checking the back of that cleaner with the shovel, and he's got this little method of flipping it around so he can get it real quick, and you know, it's like, maybe lose a couple seeds out the back of the cleaner, so then you can double your production in here. One of these trailers hooked up with raw seed from the field. We'll pull through here. This is going to get pretty loud. Dump seed into the pit, as you can see here, opening up the bottom of those trailers, they dump seed here. And this is where you have your air systems, which allow you to either go into bin storage, it'll move it through into bin storage, or if we're going direct to dump here, and it runs directly into the cleaner. Trucks will pull through, pull out, and then in harvest time, you're getting a trailer an hour, so, it's really important that you're bringing in the right material that we need at that time because though there's a lot of storage in here for raw seed, you don't, you don't want to store something that we don't need cleaned right away. After it gets dumped here, if Josh makes the decision that it's going into raw storage, it has the ability to get dumped. You can see the air vent systems up through here. Seed will get dumped into this vent. Josh, how many pounds can we get stored in here? Uh, 150 to 200,000. So you can have up to 200,000 pounds. And you can see the boarding system here, once we get it full, we'll board it, uh, and that way we don't have spillover. And you also, it's kind of like that idea of like shoving as much into the pantry as you can so you can get it sealed off. We have to fill up the bins too if we want to use the aisle. So we can't, we can't fill this full and have all the, you know, boards not be backed up by seed. So. so what we do a good job of though is this cleaner will clean bluegrass and perennial ryegrass. When we're cleaning bluegrass, we'll bring it in, we'll get it cleaned, and then when we transition into perennial, there's only perennial and there's only one variety and one field going into this bin. We're not gonna take five or six different varieties and shove them together because then we can't deliver the true product of what we're going for. So if Pangea is getting brought in here, it's only Pangea, it's out of one field, or if it's out of the fields that are right next to each other, similar quality, and that's how we get good quality seed, predictable seed, and that's how you store good clean seed and make sure you're delivering what you said you were to the customer. Two and a half to three million pounds of seed, raw, unclean seed can be stored in here at one time. Nothing ever comes in here and just sits for long periods of time. If it's made the decision to get brought in, it's getting clean. When seed goes through the cleaning machine, both air and screens are used to separate different materials. Screen size makes it so that seed can fall through, but larger material is kept out. Sifting screens are used as well to remove soil or sand materials that came out of the field during harvest. It's definitely a dirty job, but the machine is essential to delivering clean seed. So you can see in there, it's pretty much, there's some chaff, there's some premature, premature seed that didn't, that didn't ever fill. But this is all stuff that 
would be labeled as inert if it does make its way into his bag. But as you can see, when you're doing this right, you get a lot of that material out, and that's how you get that 98, 99 pure clean seed is this is what we're removing. We then got a chance to talk to Duane, who's one of the owners of Golden Valley Farms and has years of experience in farming in this area. Today they were putting the finishing touches on some new combines getting ready to start harvest. These combines are, well, like I said, it's not a conventional combine. They're uh, rotary style, which is very common now in the United States. But basically that row comes into the, the header, it goes through an accelerator. So it comes in this way, but, but when it goes through the rotor, it's twisting it and, and kind of like corkscrewing it out. Mm -hmm. And But as it, the front part of the rotor is designed so it has thrashing elements on the rotor and it thrashes it out, rubs the seed out as it goes. And then the back side of the rotor is kind of for, it starts separating out the straw. So anything that gets caught up, any loose seed that gets caught up in the, the back part of the rotor is able to fall out. It's simple in concept, but it's, there's a lot going on. So the first part, you get all that chaff and stem and stuff. So then the combine works like a little seed cleaner. All that stuff drops down onto shaker pans and then it starts sifting out the long stems and the junk and all that. And that stuff pukes out the back and then it drops to another sifter. So there's usually two sifters before it goes to what's gonna go into the grain tank. Okay. So, so it's already doing like some of that cleaning process oh, right yeah, away. Yeah. And, yeah. and so like if I do a bad job out here, I'll get a, a phone call from my seed cleaner guy saying, hey, you're bringing in too much junk. You need to clean it up. Or, I mean, I've been doing it long enough. I know what's a good sample and stuff, but you can bring in the whole field, <laughs> but it does no good to get 50% clean out. Yeah. Right. I'm trying to get my clean out where I have pure seed. I like to be under 15%. So it speeds up the process in the seed cleaner and you're not hauling junk because it costs money to haul and ship it this stuff. So why store junk? Why haul junk? Right. Leave it in the field. And by that you mean you want less than 15% of waste? Yes. Right. Yeah, like the sticks and the stems and the, the leaf and the chaff. Leave the chaff in the field. Yeah. You're gonna get a, you're gonna get some of it. Sure. But so that's just, that's where the, the fine tune fine tuning comes with. That's kind of experience like I chase these combines once they start in the morning, all day, every day, because weather changes, field changes, variety changes. One variety might be more brittle and break up more. So you gotta adjust the combine. You might wanna slow your rotor down or speed it up. There's so many different right. elements. And Lots so, of experience. That you yeah, and, and, then, and, even the, and even the sieve adjustment, you know, you can open it up more, let more go through or close it down. And then I also, with me, we're in the straw business, and um, so all the grass, after you take the seed off it, you get the straw. Well, the straw is valuable, so I don't wanna grind it and chew it up too much and throw out a bunch of little pieces. Well, then when they come in to make a bale, that doesn't make a good bale. Right. So I'm, my goal is to grind it hard, knock all the seed out, sift that out, but also keep longer stems and straw so I have something to bale and sell. Yeah. Right. So it's that fine line of, getting your seed, but making a good product yep. for hay. That's cool so. that you can kind of use everything, you know, the whole process and use it for something else too. 100% of the grass plant is basically used. That's awesome. We use the straw. It goes, we ship a lot of it to Japan, Korea, and overseas for feed. Uh, we ship uh, all the seed, obviously, and the chaff is for feed pellets, same that's, for animals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's almost awesome. the entire, plant is used. Then the, the plant that's left behind, the, the crown, is valuable to work back into the soil. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it's organic matter for a healthy soil and all that. I mean, it's just the whole cycle is uh, beneficial to mm -hmm. A, the environment, the soil, and is used. Right. There's no waste. And then most of the time, are you just letting that plant regenerate yes. from that point so it just grows again next year? Yeah, so perennial crops, we'll, we typically, uh, perennial ryegrass will leave in for uh, two to three years. Sometimes they'll go four. Um, tall fescue, I've had some tall fescue plants in for 10, 12, 15 years. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's pushing it. Yeah. But uh, average is 10 years, it's nothing to, on a tall yeah. fescue. Um, Chase was kind of telling us yeah. that then they just start to get to a point where they don't yield as much and yes. yeah. For example, I have one across the road there 
Um, if you were to walk in it, you would see that's at its end of the, it was planted in 2004 okay. and it, it needs to come out this year. So, yeah. but it's planted in 2004 and it's still right. it's 2021 and it's still producing. Right. So, and perennial, you'll see perennial, um, you always get a good two years and usually based on, I'll make that judgment call on the second year in the fall. Ooh, that, that one probably can't make it three or this one's looking good. Oh, let's go three. And sometimes I'll say, oh, let's go four. Most of the time we just go two and three. These combines are designed for corn, wheat, and soybeans. That's a whole lot bigger than grass seed. So we have to like, when we get them in, we go around and we seal up. You'll see foam on the header of that combine. I haven't done this one yet. You'll see foam on the header. We seal up every little nook and cranny with foam and caulking because they're designed for corn, soybeans, and wheat, big, big stuff. From there, we move back inside the facility to see how seed is packaged and shipped out. Chase showed us the blending machine and how seed is bagged and stacked on pallets. This is where seed gets dumped, puts in this auger, feeds it up through the system, dumps into these where there's another auger. So you're dumping, usually you're doing like, take a three-way tall fescue blend, and you're dumping multiple varieties into here. It's going up, going through the hoppers, getting evenly blended throughout these hoppers, and then it goes down and gets fed into the finish, finishing area where it goes into a bag, gets sewed, and then we'll go on to our palletizing machine. Material comes off the blending line, it gets sewn right there and comes up this conveyor belt. It'll feed up through the conveyor belt. Then there is a robot arm up there that will stack the seed on the pallet, moving it through until you get 40 bags per the pallet, and then comes off at the end perfectly stacked. And then we go and then we get it wrapped, shrink wrapped and palletized. And this is where finished goods will be when they are ready to ship out. Now it was time to see the grass fields themselves. I've seen so many corn and bean fields in my day in the Midwest, but nothing quite like this. The first field we stopped at was, of course, ryegrass. See the seed heads coming up. So is this one almost ready then, Chase? No, we got another couple weeks probably. We've got germ um, on a lot. On most of this is pretty much done, um, but the seed's starting to fill. It's like in a dough stage, like it's real soft. There's different stages of seed development. So you can kind of see it's developing. Yep. But then if you were to take it and kind of like squeeze it open, see it's still doughy on the inside? Yep. So it's there, but it's filling. So this is a tall fescue, so just look at the difference in the seed heads. Yep. So each one of these is a seed. You can see them there. So where's bluegrass at then, Chase? Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington, Columbia Basin. It gets grown over there because of the winters. That you gotta have a, a harder winter for bluegrass to uh, be grown correctly. When we're out here and looking at fields and looking at quality, I mean, things we wanna look at are contaminants from possible weed contamination that can happen and um, the other things we're looking at is overall health of the plant disease same things that you're looking at in your yard or do we have any problems going on with disease pressure and then as we start getting closer and closer um, to harvest we're looking at seed yield potential so estimating how much are we going to bring in and then a lot of that is based off historic usage each variety also kind of has a average yield it produces in certain areas so we know that this field is probably going to do between 1,600 to 1,800 pounds um, in this location. So it's a good communication with our field department on how much seeds coming in, what qualities are coming in, and it's a, a lot of coordination. But at the end of the day, that's what it takes in order to get that much seed moved in those small windows of August and September. So what would cause like some of these spots that are just more bare or don't have as much cover? It's usually just because a seed wasn't put in that area or a seed didn't take. Maybe it, same thing in a lawn, you know, how you have wash. Yep. For example, we could have gotten a really heavy rain and it washed that area. What's difference to a home yard to seed production is um, our planting rates and our spacing. So it varies different grower to grower as far as how tight they want their row spacing from perennial to tall fescue. There's different spacings, but 
12 to 16 inches pretty standard on a spacing and what we see is we're going at 8 to 10 pounds per acre on a planting versus a home lawn which on a perennial is 8 to 10 pounds on a per thousand right so we're trying to have that plant express and go reproductive and produce seed where a homeowner is trying to create a full lawn and actually not let the plant go reproductive so different goals um, but a lot of what goes on in a home lawn is similar to what goes on in a production field it's the health of the plant we're trying to make sure the plant's healthy it's just our goals are different. Our goals are to produce seed when we're in production fields. From there, we moved on to some larger tall fescue fields. You kind of shake it like this. Oh, wow. You see how that came off? So, like, really, I mean, when he's saying you just, you have to get underneath it. You can see that's what you get. And the combine does a better job of... So you want to have it fold into the middle, too, because um, as that combine comes and picks stuff up, you'll have seed shatter as just as it's coming through. But if that seed's sitting in the middle, you have a better chance of catching it. You'll have loose seed in this row right now, not a chance to, to the plant, but it gets caught up in that windrow, right. you know, so then you right. have a chance to catch it through the combine. So what are we standing in right now? So you are in a third year production field of Rambler 2 SRP, which is one of our more popular varieties and something that we put into a lot of higher end three-way tall fescue mixes. And So this one is pretty close to being ready then? Here we're at, um, I believe it's June 23rd today, and we've seen a lot of annual hit the ground so far as being ready to cut. Each plant and each species kind of has a different maturation time, and each variety even. So you'll have certain turf types that are a little bit earlier than others, some that are a little bit later, and then you have environmental conditions and soil types, so certain fields will mature quicker than others. And you go too early, you haven't given the chance uh, the plant a chance to fill all the seeds so you're losing yield and on top of that uh, if you go too late though the seed is filled too much it's too mature when we go through and cut we'll actually have shatter yeah. and it'll fall out of the rows so um, you're trying to balance that optimum window of having enough moisture where that seed wants to stay on the plant and has had a chance to fill but also not going too far where we lose a whole bunch of seed to mm -hmm. shatter one thing I've been hearing a lot about some of the record years that you guys had last year with everything going on in the world and people being home more and stuff so do you want to talk a little bit about kind of how that's working out this year sure. what, what's going on with seed yeah so i think the seed industry was really confused on what was going to happen when covid hit you know there was predictions um on the golf side of things that we were going to lose 10 to 15 percent of golf courses across uh, the u.s which is terrifying for someone in the seed industry with the golf being a huge market we started thinking about sports if schools aren't in session high schools aren't going to put money into their athletic fields colleges aren't going to put money into their athletic fields so we were as an industry really unsure of what the future was going to be we didn't know if people were going to want to put money into their home lawns what turns out though is with the lockdowns people started staying at home doing lots of projects they're now staring at that yard every day and they want they want to have that look better and they need something to do. They're stuck at home with, and seed sales, especially on the retail side, were records that we've never seen before. Um, huge record movements. And, and then on the professional side, we actually had a much better year than anticipated. Golf experience growth that we haven't seen before. One of the only sports that was open was a, a social distancing safe activity to do. Right. So we saw golf rounds explode. Golf is the healthiest place that it's been since pre-2008 recession. So instead of a 10 to 15% loss in golf courses, we're seeing golf courses having a 20 to 30% up in rounds across the country. Um, the retail though is what drove this huge record movement more than normal. Um, the sod markets were strong with um, still a really strong home market going on, home buying market. So yeah, it was just kind of a perfect storm where a lot of people thought that this is gonna be devastating to our industry. It actually ended up causing some of the biggest record movements we've seen where now we have real supply shortages across the industry, across all cool season species. Uh, we're getting ready for harvest 2021 right now and uh, it feels like this crop hasn't even been pulled from the field yet and it's already sold. Right. Um, it, it's a, it's gonna be a challenge. Usually we have carryover from the previous year crop to get us started into this August, September, early window. The industry really has no carryover of any species. So mm -hmm. everyone's gonna want 
everything clean. All the seed companies here are going to want their seed cleaned in all species, all varieties. So it's going to be a real challenge. We have challenges just with freight. You right. know, we have freight issues going on across not just the seed industry, across all industries. There's going to be a lot of challenges this fall as far as getting seed from this field to the end user. Especially I didn't know until I got out here or talked to you more was that there's just not unlimited amount of supply of everything. Sure. It's like this is a field and we have it yep. here and what's here is here. So. Yep. So we get one harvest a year. Um, so you get one chance at producing what you need for that year. Um, and a lot of that is dictated on mother nature. You know, mother nature plays a huge role on the yields we get. Um, we've had a particularly dry spring. Um, we're looking at probably a lighter crop than average across the industry. How light we'll see here shortly. But that also comes at a time of where we have really short inventories. So it's gonna be um, a lot of challenges on inventories and allocating seed. Yeah, so we can't manufacture this stuff. That's one of the things that a lot of people get confused. It's like, no, I am sold out of fourth millennium. No, I am sold out of Pangea. And it's because I get one harvest a year and there's only so much of it to go around to everybody. The next day I was able to see harvest in action. Swathing machines cut the grass and place it in rows so it can dry out and be ready for the combine to harvest. You know, so there's two different types of swather that are really common out here. There's sickle bar swathers, and this, these are rotary cutters. Rotary cutters are gonna go a little bit faster, um, 15, 20 miles an hour, even a little bit faster than that. I was also able to take a ride in this machine. So sorry in advance for some shaky footage here, but going 15 miles an hour in this thing while cutting, it's a little hard to hold the camera straight. It was pretty much just like mowing at full speed, but amazingly fun. After jumping out of this machine, we made our way to a convoy of combines. Today they happen to be harvesting crimson clover, but aside from a few setting changes on the combine, the work is pretty much exactly the same when harvesting grass seed. I got another ride along to see how these machines operate and see the view from the cab. I know how it is, I have to climb up there with my lunchbox. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if you want to learn. Yeah. I got my idle here. So slow, and then you slowly can idle it up. And then I have my header and my separator. The separator is what shoots the stuff out the back. So on low idle, turn the separator on. Some dust will shoot out the back. And then you idle it up, turn the header on. Awesome. It's so amazing how just that little, like, it just picks it right up underneath without how fast those little fingers are going mm -hmm. so that you kind of want it to just be shoveling the row in because if it's pulling it it's throwing the seat off and if it's pushing it it's just not feeding it through quite right we get to go 1.2 miles an hour yeah. i'm sure that's the thing that you know you sit here for a while and you're just kind of like yeah i want to go a little bit faster yeah, yeah. no yeah you, grass seed well i guess rather than clover like in the fescue and stuff we used to we usually go like four miles an hour so it's like zooming after you get out of this. Yeah. Instead of going about 15 miles per hour while swathing, these machines are only going slightly over one mile per hour. That's a lot of field to cover, so multiple machines work at the same time.
My trip to Oregon was definitely a highlight of 2021 so far. Just like I'm passionate about creating and learning something new every day, you can instantly feel the passion that these people have for their industry and for their way of life. It takes a lot of dedication to your craft to make all this work, and I was thankful to be able to see it firsthand. Thank you to everyone who gave up some precious time to help my wife and I learn more about this industry, and especially to Chase at Turf Merchants for coordinating the trip and being such a fantastic resource for all things grass seed. Thanks so much for watching this series, and I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time.